Lord, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, Lord. Help us to apply it to our lives and be different because of it. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Good morning. We are in our third week of our Church 101 series. Are you feeling smarter? You don't have to lie. We're in church. No, I'm just kidding. When I was 22 years old, I left on a road trip, month-long road trip, to South Dakota. I looked at a map and I figured out it was the furthest I could get in a month and get back in time for work. And I'd never seen Mount Rushmore, so I thought that sounded like a good idea. And my plan was to travel east to Phoenix to visit a friend and then travel north up through Flagstaff and then turn northeast through the Four Corners, which is the, the best letdown site in America. You stand there and you're like, yep, there, there they are. There's the Four Corners. That's it. Then I was going to go north through Colorado into Wyoming and South Dakota. And, it, and at first, the trip started out great. Drove out east to, uh, to Phoenix, had all my snacks in the car, had my drinks, visited my friend. And a couple days later, it started to take a turn for the worst. I headed north on my way to Flagstaff and my car began to overheat, which is exactly what you don't want to see when you're on a month long road trip. And so I did what any American would do in the middle of July. I turned my heater up to full blast. I rolled my windows down and I prayed. And thankfully I made it all the way to Flagstaff and pulled into a service station. The person said, it's no problem. You just need to change your thermostat. And I said, okay. And so I paid $300, had my thermostat replaced and was ready to get going again. And so I leave Flagstaff and I start driving and I'm happy, right? It's a month long vacation. I've got the music blasting. I got my beef jerky in my lap. I've got my Coke in the cup holder. And sure enough, after about an hour and a half, my car starts to overheat again. Only this time, I'm in the middle of nowhere. If you're familiar with the Flagstaff region, you know that when you leave Flagstaff heading north, you hit nothing. You're in the middle of the desert. In fact, just shortly after leaving Flagstaff, you enter the Navajo Nation, which means that there's no houses, no cities, no buildings, no cars, nothing. And at first, it's great because you're driving through this beautiful desert landscape. But when your car starts to smoke, it's not great. And so I immediately pulled over, popped open the hood, and diagnosed the problem like an expert mechanic. Right away, I could tell where the smoke was coming from. It was from the big fire right on top of my engine. And so I ran to my, into my car, grabbed the only liquid I had, which was my Coke, dumped it on the engine, and sat there wondering what I was gonna do now. There was no cell service, and I hadn't seen a person for about 45 minutes. And so I just kind of sat there on my car, stewed about what I was going to do and what my trip was going to look like. And finally, after about 20 or 30 minutes, my car engine cooled off enough that I was able to get it started again. And my plan was to just to get as far as I could to be as close to the next building as I could. And so I started driving and after about 10 miles, my car started smoking again. And as I crested over a hill, I came to a gas station in the distance. And I see these little flames starting to pop up. I'm getting nervous. My car engine dies and I coast into this gas station, the only building I had seen for probably 60, 70 miles. Thank God. And so I pulled into this gas station thinking, I'm going to be spending the night in the Navajo Nation. There is nothing around. What am I going to do? And after sitting there for about a half an hour, it hits me. I had totally forgotten about this. But about two days before I left on my trip, my dad had suggested that I upgrade my AAA package from the regular package, which gives you about 10 miles of free towing, to the AAA plus package, which gives you about 90 miles of towing. He said, Thomas, you're gonna be driving through some pretty remote areas, and it would probably be wise of you to get this plus package. And I said, okay, dad, that sounds like a smart idea. And so I went over to this broken down payphone at the gas station, I called AAA and about two hours later, AAA showed up and towed me to the nearest city, which was Flagstaff back in the other direction, <laughs> 95 miles. And the tow truck driver comped me the extra five miles so I wouldn't have to pay. He told me if I didn't have AAA, it would have cost me $600 to tow my car back to Flagstaff, only to find out that my car was junked. I had to junk my car 
leave it in Flagstaff, fly back to San Diego and spend the next three and a half weeks of my vacation in my bedroom crying <laughs> by myself. In that moment, I was in trouble. I mean, I was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I was truly out, as far out in the desert as you could be. I was totally alone. It was in, in the hot summer days. And, and yet, because of my AAA membership, I, I kind of was saved. And sometimes our memberships can really save our lives. At other times, our memberships can cost us everything. You know, I think about the early church. In the first generations of the early church, the, the church really, contrary to popular belief, had no idea what they were doing. I mean, they really didn't. Uh, they, they knew what Jesus had taught them, but the, Jesus hadn't given them an instruction manual. He didn't give them a guide to, to how to plant a church. He didn't give them a class that they could take to, to give them training. He essentially said, I've been with you for three years. Go and do what I've done. And by the way, I want you to go to the ends of the earth and I want you to convert everyone. And the disciples were left wondering, you know, what are we supposed to do? They were confused about a lot of things that they hadn't been instructed on. You know, are they still Jews? If they're Gentiles, are they supposed to become Jews before they follow Jesus? Were they supposed to be missionaries or, or evangelize where they live? Were they a political movement, a social movement, or a spiritual movement, or, or some mix of, of all three? I mean, what were they? They were left to figure these kinds of things out. And at times, it was easy. At times, it was just a conversation. You know, where do we fall on eating food sacrificed to, to idols? Where do we fall on eating food like pigs? Do we still need to sacrifice in the temple? Do we still need to do, do ritual washing? Do we still need to follow the law or, or not follow the law? And at times it was easy, but at other times it became difficult. And because of the divisions within the church and the difference between the church and the secular culture around them, oftentimes it led to persecution, isolation, and marginalization. Not just in the physical sense of persecution, but in the social sense. You know, I think a lot of times when we think of persecution, we, we think of physical violence, which happens all the time and is happening all around the world, even to this day. But persecution comes in all sorts of different forms. It can be harder to get jobs. It can be harder to find spouses. It can be harder to do business. Persecution comes in all different forms. And you can imagine why, especially in the first century. For the Jews, Christians weren't Jewish enough. For the Gentiles, they weren't Roman enough. You know, in the first century, Christians were accused of being cannibals for eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ. They were, they were, uh, they were called atheists by the Romans for rejecting the Roman gods. They were called polytheists by the Jews for believing in the Trinity. In a sense, the Christians didn't have a place in the first century religious landscape. And that left them open to practically every form of persecution available. To a member of the Church of Christ in the first century, it, it essentially guaranteed that you didn't have a place in the world, that you had nowhere to belong, and the only people that you could count on were other believers. They were your community. They became your family. There's a reason why Jesus said, who is my mother and my father and my brothers and my sisters, those who believe in me? He wanted the disciples to understand that when times get tough, that it was the church that you could count on. It was the people of God whom you'd form relationships with and would support you through the difficult times and the persecution. We see throughout his ministry that Jesus must have anticipated this type of reaction because over and over again, he attempts to prepare his disciples for what would come. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 20. He says, or what Jesus said in John. He says, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. He's talking to his disciples here, but he's also talking to you and I. He says, I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. I mean, isn't it a wonder that Jesus had any disciples? I mean, listen to how he's teaching. He said, the world's going to hate you. The world's going to reject you. Your life's going to fall apart. Now come and follow me. I mean, he must have known that the church would face great isolation and great persecution. And so he didn't mince words with his disciples. He wanted them to know the cost of what it meant to follow Jesus. Jesus. 
And so he taught them to expect it. He, he taught them to be on the lookout for the persecution that they would face. But he didn't just talk about belonging to the church and the consequences that would follow. He also went a step further. He gave them signs that they could use to identify true believers, true members of the church, signs that would bind them together as one community, across borders, across cultures, across languages. You see, when, what Jesus knew was that when the church faced its most serious forms of persecution, that they would need to bind together, that they would need to support each other and rise up and rise to the occasion that was before them. And because of that, they would need some way to distinguish the members of their community from the members of the world. And so Jesus gave them two signs of membership, one that would serve as a form of initiation and one that would serve, serve as a form of renewal of membership. He gave them the practices of baptism and communion, two sacred acts that would go on to distinguish the church community from the secular community around it. The type of behavior that confirms that you have not only chosen to follow Christ, but that you're willing to give up everything to do so. And for the next 2,000 years, the church used these acts, baptism and communion, to identify fellow followers of Jesus who were not only committed to their faith, but who were willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of it. In good times and bad times, in the face of persecution and pain, in the face of suffering, the church used baptism and communion as a sign that, that the members of the church were willing to go to great lengths to follow Jesus. And they did so because they understood that baptism and communion were not only unique to the church, but commanded by Christ and essential to their identities as followers of Jesus. Now, this might seem extreme to you. It, it does to me, in a sense. If you've grown up in a church where baptism and communion were taken lightly or casually, you might be wondering what the big deal is. You know, at one of my former churches, I was surprised to discover that virtually every student in my youth group who had been following Jesus for years and who had grown up in the church had not been baptized. It was amazing. Many of these kids' parents were, were elders in the church and deacons in the church, and yet none of them had been baptized. And when I asked their parents why this was the case, their parents said, well, we don't want to force them into anything. We, we want it to be their choice. And there's some truth to that. We want our children to be choosing their faith. But what they didn't realize was that in not talking about it and emphasizing it, they actually devalued it. And they made it optional. And every single one of these kids in this youth group saw following Jesus as being important, but baptism as being something extra. It was kind of something you did if you, if you had time to do it. The unfortunate thing is, this just isn't biblical. The Bible is totally clear that after you've chosen to follow Jesus, that baptism is the next step. That baptism is the natural evolution of our faith in Jesus. In fact, it's so important that Jesus begins his ministry with it. The very first thing Jesus does when he begins his ministry is he goes to the Jordan River and is baptized. In Mark chapter 1, verse 9, Mark writes this, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. He also finishes his ministry with it. In Matthew chapter 28, when, when Jesus gives the greatest commandment, he tells his disciples this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is one of the last times that Jesus is going to talk to his disciples on the earth. And what does he tell them? I, I don't just want you to make disciples. I want you to make disciples who are baptized. To be baptized in a, is an essential expression of faith. And so we see that from the beginning of his ministry to this, the end of his ministry, baptism is essential in the life of a believer. Now, the disciples were no different. We see in the book of Acts that the disciples right away begin to go out and make disciples and baptize them. In Acts chapter 3, 3,000 people come to faith. And what do they do? They immediately go and are baptized that very day. In Acts chapter 8, the eunuch believes and he's baptized. In Acts chapter 10, new believers come to faith and they go and baptize. In Acts chapter 16, a whole family comes to faith and the family goes and is baptized. All over the book of Acts, we see people getting baptized. Why? Because the church is growing 
and the next natural progression of their faith is to be baptized. And so the question that we should be asking ourselves is, what is baptism, right? I mean, this is Church 101, so we shouldn't take for granted that people know what baptism is. What is baptism? And in order for us to understand what baptism is, we really have to understand a little bit about the social and religious context of the practice. Because both baptism and communion are actually borrowed from earlier Jewish practices that were reapplied in a Christian context. And these earlier practices help us to understand the significance of the acts. You know, you have to remember that the Christian church in its modern form was never really meant to exist, right? I mean, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Jesus had come for the Jews first. He says, I came first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. Why? Because the Jews were supposed to believe, right? Jesus was supposed to come to the Jews. They were supposed to recognize him as Messiah. And then through their faith and through their belief, they were meant to become a light to the nations, which is why the Jews kept going to the temple after Jesus came, which is why the Jews kept celebrating the festivals and the Jewish practices. The Jews were meant to be the light to the world. The Jews kept going to the temple until when? Do you know when? When the temple was destroyed. The Jews, uh, I'm sorry, the Christians who were following Jesus kept going to the temple until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And when it was destroyed, persecution broke out and the Christian church and the Jewish church began to split. But the Jews were meant to be the light to the world. Christians were meant to join the Jewish tradition. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when Jesus creates the signs of membership, he borrows from Jewish practices and then he reapplies them to himself in light of who he is as the Messiah. And so when Jesus gives his disciples their first two signs of membership in the church, he, he takes from practices and he applies them in a way that brings light to him as Messiah, but still honors the tradition from which he came. So in the case of baptism, Jesus borrows from the Jewish practice of ritual washing. You might have heard me talk about this before. If you've been to Israel, you've probably seen the mikvahs or religious or ritual baths that are strewn all about the first century ruins all over Israel. A mikvah is essentially a, a fancy word that means a collection of water. And these mikvahs are just basically stone bathtubs or stone basins that were carved into the homes or the religious buildings of first century Israel. And essentially they were places where if you had touched something that made you spiritually unclean, which is different than being sinful, you can be spiritually unclean without being sinful. But if you touched the, the blood of a dead body, or if you came into contact with someone who had a skin disease, you became spiritually unclean. And if that was the case, you would go down into the mikvah and you would wash yourself with living water. This living water was water that had been collected from a moving source, like rainwater or river water. They called it living water. Does it sound familiar? And so they wash in the mikvah and then they are clean and they're, they're acceptable to go before God to offer sacrifices. But when John the Baptist comes along, he takes this practice of ritual washing and he evolves it. He says, I'm not just going to wash you to make you spiritually clean. I want you to come and be washed for the repentance of your sins. And so John takes this and he adapts it and he moves it forward. And then Jesus comes along and the church begins to understand it even more differently. See, after the church sees Jesus buried and resurrected, the church comes to understand the fullness of this mysterious practice that the Jews have been doing for a thousand years. They, they come to understand that the process of, of washing someone and bringing them up out of the water isn't just about spiritual cleanliness. It's about freedom from our slavery. It's about freedom from our sins. When they see Jesus being buried and resurrected, they finally get the fullness of this picture that's been painted for them for a thousand years in Israel. Listen to what Paul comes to the conclusion of in Romans chapter 6. He says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. For if we've been united with him in death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, 
that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from their sin. See, what Paul came to realize was that, that the, the work that Jesus had done on the cross was imagined and pictured in the practice of this ritual washing. And he came to realize that, that the work of Jesus could be illustrated through this practice of baptism. And so when we're baptized, we identify ourselves with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We go down into the water. We're buried. We leave our old self behind. And when we come out of it, we experience the new life that God has created us for. There's this eternal bond that's formed, this seal that's placed on us that cannot be removed until we stand before Jesus in heaven. It's not a casual act. It's not just a, a sorry excuse for a pool party. To be baptized is a profound divine act in which we associate, associate ourselves with the work of Jesus. Which is why the church has historically taken it so seriously. There have been countless church councils about this very subject, about how to take it and when to take it. I have a book. I meant to grab it in my office. Uh, it's, it's called the, the History of Baptism in the Early Church, and it's this thick, this thick. And that's just the early church, okay? This is a subject that has been gone over and over and over again because it's such a serious and important topic. You know, during the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, there was a group called the Anabaptists. And it's actually where we get our modern name for Baptists. And this group, the Anabaptists, taught and believed that the only people who should be baptized are people who are old enough to make a faith profession. Actually, that's what we believe here at Legacy Church today. Unfortunately, the Anabaptists were a little bit ahead of their time because neither the Protestant churches nor the Catholic church believed this. They, they believed in baptizing infants. And so they persecuted the Anabaptists. They arrested them, they tortured them, and they killed them for their belief on baptism. In 1527, one of the leaders of this movement, Felix Manns, was executed by drowning, which was meant to be sort of this ironic parody for his teaching on baptism. Two years later, in 1529, George Blaurock was burned at the stake for baptizing adult believers. Baptism is central to our belief as Christians. At the same time, in the 16th century in Japan, Christians were being converted by the hundreds, but they were also being arrested, tortured, and executed for being baptized, which led to a secret movement of Christians called the Kakure Krishitan, which, is, which means hidden Christians. And for the next 300 years in Japan, Christians practiced and were baptized in secret to avoid persecution. In the 19th century, in a country called Buganda, which would later become our modern-day Uganda, there was a revival among young servants in the king's palace. And when they came to faith, they went and were baptized in secret. And when the king found out, they were executed for their baptism. Throughout the history of the church, people have seen baptism as a central and vital expression of being a member of Christ's body, the church. People have fought and died to be associated with Christ through the practice of baptism. And because of that, we should be careful to never take it lightly. Now, thankfully, in America, we don't face this type of persecution usually, right? We don't worry about being burned at the stake anymore. But that doesn't mean that we don't face our own set of obstacles, right? I mean, it can be intimidating to get baptized. It can be intimidating because we still face all sorts of social and cultural and uh, family pressures that prevent us from wanting to take this step of faith. Maybe we're afraid of looking weird. Maybe, we, maybe we're a manager at our job and we're afraid that if our coworkers find out we've been baptized, they're going to think that we're a religious nut. Oh, that person, yeah, I know he's a Christian, but now he's really a Christian. This guy's been baptized. Or maybe you grew up in a family in which your family members either don't practice a faith or practice another faith. You know, if you grow up in a family that practices another faith, you run the risk of being excommunicated from your family, of being cut off. There's plenty of families out there that if you were to be baptized and profess your faith in Jesus, would say you have no part in our family. You can't be a part of our family if you follow those weirdos. And so you might feel that family pressure. Well, maybe, uh, maybe it's something else. I, I had a friend who it was a Jew, uh, culturally and uh, religiously growing up. 
And, and as she got closer to converting to Christianity, uh, the biggest thing that she feared, her biggest hang up, was that she couldn't shake the feeling that if she were to convert to Christianity, she would be abandoning all of her Jewish ancestors who had died in World War II. She had this feeling that if she were to, to follow Jesus, that she would be leaving behind all of these, these courageous Jews who had stayed faithful to their faith and been killed in the concentration camps. And for years, she wrestled with this. And finally, after praying for it, she was visited by Christ in a vision who told her, don't worry about following me, that I am the first Jew. Come and follow me. And then she had peace about it. There's all sorts of reasons why we might, might uh, allow ourselves to be afraid of being baptized. The truth is, being baptized takes an enormous step of faith, even in modern-day America where we don't fear physical persecution. But if that's you, if you're a follower of Jesus and you have yet to be baptized, I want you to know that it doesn't change the fact that it's still a command of Christ. And I think sometimes we want to kind of have our cake and eat it too. We want the assurance of salvation. We want our relationship with Jesus, but we don't want it to cost us everything. But the Bible is clear that to follow Jesus costs you everything. That you can't just dip your toe in the water. That you have to dive in. You have to be willing to lay down everything for the sake of the gospel. And so Christ calls us to be baptized as a show of faith to demonstrate our initiation into the family of God, the church. Jesus didn't just stop at baptism, though. He must have known that they would need more. He must have seen uh, the difference between gym memberships and the amount of people who actually go to the gym. He knew that just because you signed up doesn't mean that you're going to be faithful in attending. As persecution would grow and the church would become cut off from each other, they needed more than a one-time event. They needed something that would sustain them. They didn't just need an initiation into the church. They needed a renewal of membership. And so what did Jesus do? Well, on the night that he was betrayed, he was celebrating the Passover meal with his friends and he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Now you might have heard this story so many times that you don't even think of it. You could probably recite the words to me. You could say, Thomas, I could lead communion. I've been hearing that my whole life. And if that's you, that's great. Congratulations. You can have my job. No, I'm just kidding. But here's the thing. If you were a first century Jew and you were watching what was unfolding that night, you would have been startled by what Jesus was doing. Do you remember what they were celebrating at this meal? What were they celebrating? What? The Passover, right? The Passover. The Passover is, is probably the single most important meal of the Jewish culture. It's also known as the Seder meal. And do you know what they celebrate at Passover? What do they celebrate? The Passover, right? Pretty simple. That was a trick question. They celebrate the Passover, the story of the Exodus, Israel leaving slavery in Egypt. On the night of the Passover, God commanded Israel to slaughter a lamb, to spread the blood over the doorposts of their house. And when they did, the Holy Spirit would pass over their house, taking the lives of the firstborn of Egypt, but not of Israel. And so everything at the Passover meal has significance. Have you ever been to a Seder meal? If you have, you know that everything on the table has significance. The bread, the number of cups, the bitter herbs, everything has significance. And as you eat this meal, it takes three or four hours because every time you go to eat something, they stop and they talk about the significance of this item in the relation to the Exodus story. Everything in the Exodus meal points back to the work that God had done in freeing his people. It was the most sacred meal of the year in Jewish culture. And what does Jesus do? He takes the elements off the table and he applies them to himself. I mean, this would have been unheard of. This would have been unthinkable. That's, that's saying you're comparable to Moses. That's saying, saying you're comparable to Yahweh. And Jesus takes these elements during the most sacred meal of the year, and he goes, no, no, I, I've got to tell you a new story. See, when you talk about these elements, you talk about something that happened 1,300 years ago, but I'm talking about what's happening today. 
See, Jesus wanted them to know that he is the Passover lamb, that it's his blood that will save them, that it's his life that will free them from bondage. And so Jesus borrows this Passover image and he applies it to himself. Why? Because Jesus wants them to understand that he was what it was all for, that he's the center point of human history, that it's his life that will cover over the sins of his nation. And not only does he redefine the elements of Passover, but he reschedules the meal. They would celebrate the Passover once a year, but Jesus comes along and he goes, no, no, no. Whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, I want you to remember what I'm going to do for you. I mean, this just would have made no sense to them in this moment. They hadn't seen Christ crucified. They hadn't seen him resurrected. But when they look back, they realize the fullness of what Jesus had come to do for them. He must have known how hard it would be for the church. He must have known how easy it would become uh, be to, to be to, be, to succumb to the pressures that they would face culturally as they went out into the world with the Holy Spirit guiding them, trying to expose the world to the work of Jesus. And so he gave the church a way to recommit themselves, a way to, every time they gather, to recommit themselves to the work of Jesus. An act that could be done anywhere by anyone. I mean, think about the significance of that. You could be sitting around a table in China, and if you've got bread and juice and you love Jesus, you can commune together, right? You could be sitting at a table on the savannah in Africa with the Maasai tribe and be sharing communion with them. You don't have to speak their language. You don't have to know their history. All you have to do is have bread and juice. You could be sitting under a tree in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, and if you've got bread and juice, you can share in your love for Jesus with the people around you. Jesus gave, gives them this, this great, beautiful, universal practice that they can share no matter where they go. You know, when Christ left the earth, the disciples went east all the way to Asia. They went west all the way to Europe. They went to towns and places where people didn't speak their language, where people didn't understand their culture. And yet when they loved Jesus, they could all share communion together. Communion is the single most important unifying act that the church can do. In the second century, when persecution broke out uh, against Roman Christians, the Christian would, Christians would climb down into the catacombs, these tombs where people had been buried under the streets, and they would have worship services by candlelight. And chaos were happening on the streets above that they would still share in the communion of Christ. And so they served each other the bread and the cup by candlelight in the catacombs of Rome. Five months after World War I had broken out, when fighting was fierce, the, the Pope called for peace for one day of ceasefire on Christmas. The leaders of at home refused. But the men on Christmas morning standing in the trench Merry Christmas! And as they did, they started to climb out of their trenches. And for one day, the fighting ceased and German soldiers and European soldiers met in no man's land and shared Christmas together. They had snowball fights. They gave each other gifts. They hugged each other. They even had a soccer match in no man's land. And the Christians among them had a worship service in which the priests served both the Germans and the Europeans, communion. Communion is the most unifying act that the church can do. It's a powerful symbol of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In South Africa, during the era of apartheid, communion was a point of significant tension. Religious communities wouldn't serve the, the black members and white members of their church at the same time. But brave pastors, people like Desmond Tutu, refused to allow government regulation to stop them. And they served communion to both the black and the white members of their church together. A powerful symbol of rebellion and community, giving dignity to all people regardless of their skin tone. 
Communion has been used for 2,000 years as an act of unity for the church, showing that no matter where we come from, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're white or black, whether we come from Asia, Europe, Africa, South America, it doesn't matter where we come from, that we all have dignity when we come to the table of Jesus. Throughout the centuries, communion has been a powerful tool for unity among the church, a powerful symbol of faith. Something that we can do anywhere, at any time, with any believers. An opportunity to recommit ourselves and renew our membership in the body of Christ. The band's going to come forward now, but I want to finish by, by saying this. It can be easy as American Christians to take things like baptism and communion for granted. You know, when things are freely available, uh, they run the risk of becoming acts of convenience. But the Bible is clear. The baptism and communion are not acts of convenience. They're not extras. They're commands of Christ, meant to be shared by all who call themselves followers of Christ. Those who have counted the cost and paid the cost to follow him. They're symbols of belonging, measures of membership, meant to be used by the church to inspire faith and increase commitment to the work of Christ in the world. So may we be a church that takes baptism seriously. May we be a church that takes communion seriously so that when we do these things, we not only do them as individuals, but we do them as people who step into the stream of believers who have come before us and lived and died so that they could do these things. Amen? Uh, I've got a couple of things for you. In response to this command, we're going to do two things. Number one, we're going to have communion today, an opportunity to share in the communion of saints who have gone before us in our mutual love for Christ. The second is going to be baptism. We're not going to do that today, but I had an idea this last week. We have Easter coming up, and I just couldn't shake the feeling, what would be a better way to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus on Easter than to see followers of Christ baptized. Amen? And so I want to give you the opportunity, if you are following Jesus, to be baptized on Easter. It's going to be a blowout celebration. There's going to be people filling this room, Christians from all over East County and San Diego. And we want to give you a chance in front of your brothers and sisters in Christ to take this step of faith. So if you're interested in getting baptized, we'll set everything up for you. It's going to be really easy but you just gotta let us know that you're interested in it. So, so immediately following the service, either come talk to me or, or somebody else, Pastor Troy over here, or somebody that you see on stage, or go to the welcome table and, uh, and let them know that you wanna be baptized on Easter and we will set that up for you. Jesus is here, he's inviting you to be a member of his church and he gives you these two signs as membership. In Revelation 3.19, Jesus says to the church, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me pray for us. Lord. Give us the faith to step out and be baptized and give us the courage to renew our commitment to you through communion. Father, thank you that you give us tangible, universal signs that we can do anywhere with anyone. Thank you that you give us signs to remind us, Lord, that when we walk this journey of faith, we do not walk it alone. Help us to experience you in a new way this morning as we take communion and remember all